So, hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews for Hospital Radio and my YouTube channel. And I'm super excited to be joined by the very talented Catherine Russell. Thank you for joining me, Catherine. It's a great pleasure. What a great idea. Well done. And I'm loving the Christmas background for yourself. It's, uh, it's very festive for you. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, I do love a bit of Christmas. <laughs> now, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> now obviously, this year has been a very, very weird year. Uh, you know, the the world has kind of gone upside down, crazy. How were you affected in the early stages of lockdown? Because you were you you know not long finished from Holby. So, how has life been for you this year? Um, it's it's been um a, a bit rubbish. Um, I so I decided to leave Holby left in October 2019 because I wanted to go back into the theatre, got myself a fantastic theatre job which I was so excited about um, and you know two weeks before or something like that we were due to start rehearsing my world came to an end the same as so many other people's and so that was that so I've had a year of uh, unemployment that I wasn't expecting. Um, I mean as an actor when you leave a job you never know when the next one it's going to come. So, uh, you know, I was sensible and I put some money aside and saved and stuff. But um, yeah, it's been frustrating um, and upsetting. But I'm, you know, I'm sure that so many of us feel the same, but not being able to work uh, when I knew that there was work to be had was, um, yeah, horrid. I mean, obviously, one thing that a lot of people have struggled with is just the, the, the not knowing what's coming next. I mean, obviously, this year has proved that one minute you think, oh, we're getting better. And then suddenly lockdowns and restrictions and all this has happened. And obviously, we're doing it because we have to and because we want to keep people safe. But at the same time, when, you know, the, you, you just you, you don't know when the end is coming. And it can be hard for you mentally um, not knowing when, you know, the next job's going to come along. So, I mean, for you, how have you kept yourself motivated and kept yourself, you know, from getting into a bad state? Um, well, uh, I, well, I did get into a bad state at one point. I had, uh, I, I've, ne I've been one of those very, very lucky people that have never suffered from any anxiety or depression or any of those sorts of things. I'm pure luck, nothing clever on my part. I can't impart any wisdom on how to avoid that. <laughs> Genetically, I got the good one on that, you know, lucky. But I, um, uh, in the first lockdown, probably I think towards the end of April, somewhere, somewhere around there, I had a panic attack. And because I'd never had anything remotely like that before, we all thought, we all thought I was having a heart attack. And we all thought I was, I was about to, to, uh, to uh, you know, part off this mortal coil. Um, I had done... Uh, a whole series of poems for children when the schools closed. I thought, gosh, how awful to be stuck at home as a child and how difficult for parents. So I, I had done, um, uh, not daily, but certainly sort of every other day or something like that, uh, um, I had sort of half learned a poem, which I put out on my YouTube channel. And um, I just sat down in the sitting room to sort of half learn the next one. And, and I sort of pain in the chair. And it was just, it was terrifying. We had to call out the ambulance. So that was um, miserable <coughs> and very scary. Um, but I did that to keep busy. I did poems to keep busy. I, my garden looked amazing. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, COVID. Um, I was very, very lucky. I am very lucky to have a garden. And that made all the difference in the world. And I grew lots of vegetables and things like that, which is not what I normally grow. So that was interesting and fun. I tried to do some exercise. I ate for England put on a vast amount of weight, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Any baking? Any baking take place? Lo lo well, I'm not a massive baker, but I am, a, I am a cook and I do love cooking. So we cooked. My daughter was, was locked down with us. She was supposed to be in Manchester at university. She is in Manchester now, not able to come home for Christmas. <laughs> um, and we all took turns in cooking. I started doing things like playing the old jigsaw, which I've never done in my life again, which I, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and then most recently, plug, 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 I've been, um, I've, I, re I read the whole of A Christmas Carol, which um, has kept me extremely busy because I didn't do that thing. You know, most people, when they read, they have it going across the screen. And I did that to begin with, but um, you can tell when someone's reading off a screen. And so you don't have what we're doing now. You don't have the communication. You don't talk to each other. 
so I sort of half learned, well, I learned it pretty much. Um, um, so that took a lot of time because I'm dyslexic. So I made, <laughs> there were a few mistakes that I ended up having to leave in there. Anyway, <laughs> you want a bit of festive cheer and you want to um, do a bit of good with any spare money that you may have hanging around. But if you don't, you can watch it for free on my YouTube channel. So if you do, if you would, I would be most pleased and delighted if you could go to my Just Giving site, Catherine Russell, A Christmas Carol, and give whatever you can. But that has kept me super busy. Power walking, <laughs> <laughs> looking mad. What about you? Well, for for me, I say a bit of baking. I was doing the the traditional, um, you know, um, banana loaves and and all that sort of thing, some muffins and things like that. Um, I also taught myself to cut my own hair over the course of lockdown because obviously oh, yeah. we couldn't go out to the barbers or anything. So I bought myself a pair of clippers and I mean, I probably need to do it again soon. Uh, but did find myself, yeah, learning to, uh, the scariest thing ever the first time I did it because it took about an hour and a half to make the first cut because you're terrified <laughs> of making a mistake. <laughs> yes, no, we've all had a go at my hair. My daughter's cut my hair. I've cut my hair. Most recently, my husband's cut my hair. <laughs> now, obviously for yourself, it must be nice to know that you know, while you've been stuck at home, you've been able to do a bit for charity. Um, so how did that kind of connection come about? And, and where did the idea for, for, for doing that for charity come from? Um, well, I started off by thinking I need to make some money for me. Um, and I need to keep my brain busy. And I mean, the, I think the difficulty with acting is a, a, a sort of similar if you play in an orchestra, you know, you need other people. So trying to come up with an idea where I didn't need other people. I've always read Christmas Carol every year. Um, I sit in this chair in my sitting room and I read it out loud. It always used to be to the children, then the children go, oh, and to, uh, to be honest with you, <laughs> I quite often sit here all on my own <laughs> reading it out loud um, and people pop in and out. So my initial idea was I'll, I'll do that and I'll put it out there and I'll link it up to some sort of coping fund, you know, where people can you know, buy me a coffee. <clears throat> and so the first thing I did was I read it through again out loud and it, as soon as I read it I realized that that me reading that book to make money for myself was absurd <laughs> and completely wrong I don't know how well you know it but I mean it is the ultimate charitable book you know it is the, the of all the books in the world you could choose to read that is the book where it says come on look after people less fortunate than yourself so I initially, immediately rather, sorry, as soon as I read it, went, right, it's got to be for charity. And then I started thinking about which charity linked up, um, uh, you know, was a, was a good marriage for that story. Um, and crisis, just, uh, crisis seemed the obvious choice to me. And how shocked would Charles Dickens be if he could see that it's still needed? And it really is. And this year, more than ever, which is... Um, which is truly shameful for the, for the for, you know, for, to be in such a wealthy country. The, you know, the disparity between them that have and them that don't have is still so huge. It's just appalling. So that's why, and then I, so I, put, it, I put the idea to Crisis and, and they came on board and said, yeah, great, let, let's go for it. So yeah, we're doing really well. The target's 10,000. Um, we're about 94% there now. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. That's, I mean, that's the great thing I would say this year is although we have had so much hard, you know, times around, it has shown that the British public can, when needed, come together for charity. I mean, obviously, look at Captain Tom, what, he, what an amazing achievement he did um, earlier this year. Obviously, everyone raising money for the NHS charities, um, you know, charity singles. We've had quite a few of them uh, around this year. So it does show that although... We, you know, people are struggling, they still can dig into, into their pockets and give what they can afford, which is, I think, a fantastic thing. Yeah, and it is extraordinary, isn't it, that this year of all years, when so many of us are on reduced incomes from what we're used to, even if, that, even if that's okay, it's still reduced. And, you know, everyone budgets, one hopes. And if your income is reduced, then it's tough. But people still do dig into their pockets. It's just... I, I don't want to get political about it, but it is such a shame that we still have to do that, particularly with things that are so basic, like food and a roof over your head. <laughs> it's quite shocking, isn't it, really? But yes, you're absolutely right. Let's look at the positive. People are kind and generous and empathetic and thoughtful on the whole. 
And then the other thing, obviously, we must mention is what an amazing job the NHS have been doing this year. Because obviously, you know, all key workers have really, you know, shone, um, you know, a light on what they do. And, and I think people may have in the past sort of taken them a bit for granted. But I think this year they've come back to the forefront. And, you know, obviously the clapping on a Thursday that everyone was doing and all of that just shows that, you know, we're still thinking about them and they're still doing a, an amazing job. Yes, no, I, I, absolutely. And, I, and I'm sure that, that seeing that outpouring of gratitude and thanks was heartwarming. However, <laughs> I can't help but saying, I'm sure a little more support and a bit more funding would probably have gone quite a long way <laughs> to make them felt pleased and heartfelt and cared for as well. But obviously as individuals, we can't do that. Well, apart from where we put our cross on the ballot paper, but we, but we can't do that. So, so the, that's, I think, where that came from, was a fr sort of frustration that they're struggling, you know, that the NHS is struggling, is underfunded, is about to go into winter, which is proper scary, right? I mean, you're in the heart of it. You must know how worried the NHS are and the staff are that what's coming up, particularly if people are silly enough not to follow the COVID rules. You know, then we could be heading for a, a, a very bleak winter if we're not if we're not careful. Now, obviously, the NHS has been a part of your life for quite a while because obviously, since 2012, <laughs> you were obviously playing uh, Serena on Holby. How did that role first come about for you? I mean, do you remember kind of you know sort of when you first uh, took your you know first steps onto the set and the first scenes you did? How was it? Uh, first days on any job are always frightening. Um, <clears throat> it came about simply the, the, the same way as, as all my acting roles come about. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, the vast, I think people don't have a, 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 a why should they, uh, a proper idea of how, of how acting works. I mean, uh, bear in mind, 80% of actors are unemployed at any one time. There's far too many of us chasing far too few jobs. So <clears throat> I just got a call saying, would you like to audition for Holby City? And I said, no. <laughs> they said, why not? I said, well, it's not very good, is it? And they said, have you ever watched it? I went, no. And they said, well, don't be such a snob. And they were right. And I watched it. And I thought, oh, yes, it's all right. And more than that, I looked at the other actors that were in it, who are all fantastically talented. Nearly all come from theatre background, which was deliberate on the part of the casting directors. <clears throat> um, because you have to have a certain level of stamina for those shows because the hours are long. Uh, you know, you get up at about five o'clock in the morning and you get home at about 8.15. Not every day, not every day. And my first day was the first scene I did, the first day I was called first thing in the morning and the day went on and on and on. And I sat in a little tiny ant infested room at and the day went on and on and on and there were two scenes and they were very wordy scenes and um, I got called in at about half and half before the end of the day <laughs> to them both with the lovely kind supportive Jimmy Akimola who um, was in the show at the time uh, and had been there for about a year at that point and, and he took me under his wing and was very kind and everybody was very sweet and very kind and, and Hugh Quashie as well was there and he was charming and lovely and, just, and they were all so relaxed and so confident and I was an absolute bundle of nerves and that took a good few months to, to go because the pace is so fast and the dialogue is so difficult <laughs> and medical stuff that you have to pretend that you know what you're talking about. I mean that was one thing I was going to ask is how do you remember all those very technical hospital jargon words? Oh, repetition, 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 repetition. It's so boring. I am ancient enough to have to get up and, and have a pee in the night. And whenever I knew, every time I ever got up, if I had a difficult medical world, they're half asleep as I would walk along the corridor <laughs> to the bathroom. If I could say the word without thinking about it, I knew I'd learned it properly. But I mean, yeah, just just repetition is the only way. And, uh, and also um, really finding out what, it, what the words mean. There's something about knowing what a word means that makes it easier to remember. I mean, obviously you were on the show for, I think it was nearly eight years you were there. I mean, what would you say are your memories, your, your, your best memories from the show, or what have you taken away from that job? Uh, I, I think the, the best memories, I mean, what's nice about doing a long running job like that, and I've come across it a couple of times before when I've been in shows um, <clears throat> for a long period of time, 
is that you you get to the point where you're trusted and you have a voice which is an actor you tend not to have you know you're the last cog in the wheel you're the least important person there until someone said turn over on you um and it was very nice to be able to they used to the the, um, the producers used to describe the actors as the show's safety net so often you know they're churning out 52 hours of television a year that is just such a phenomenal output that the writing can't always be a hundred percent it can't the continuity can't always be completely accurate and so you would say things like oh, hang on a minute uh, in, a, in about a year ago i had a, i did a thing where i said i hated coffee and yet in this episode they've got me drinking coffee that's a stupid uh, example but that's the sort of thing so it was very nice to be able to have a voice and be, and be asked an opinion and be, and, and be allowed to voice an opinion. But the main thing that everybody takes away from working at Holby City is that it feels like family. It is an extremely friendly, supportive, kind atmosphere to work in. And when it works, it works at its best when it's collaborative. All acting works at its best when it's collaborative. In fact, I think probably every job works best when it's collaborative, don't you think? And, that, and it is, it is, and, it, and, and, I, and I, you know, miss the people for that. And I imagine when you leave a show like Colby, as well, the character you play, I mean, that must be hard to say goodbye to that character. So how did you sort of prepare yourself for, for having to say goodbye to that character? Um, it's, that's interesting you should say that. I feel that in the theatre quite often, um, particularly if it's been a, a part that you feel that you've, nailed i mean often you don't you know often you come away going oh i should have done that and if i've done that and if i revisited i did that but occasionally just occasionally one sinks into your soul in a way that another doesn't and those those parts are very difficult to walk away from to be very honest with you i don't think i've ever really felt that about a character that's been on film and i can't i'm not sure why that is maybe it's because every single scene is different and every single day is different whereas in the theater you're revisiting you're revisiting so you're constantly tweaking and just getting it better so it gets into your veins in a way that um, television doesn't and obviously you know uh, during your time on the show i know one of the the, the big storylines was obviously the relationship um um that obviously serena uh, had and obviously working with with Gemma, i imagine that was a lot of fun as well Working with Gemma is a hoot, literally, because Gemma Redgrave, as anybody will tell you that's worked with her, has the most extraordinary laugh in the world that I have ever heard. And it is completely and utterly contagious, and I defy anybody not, not to find themselves laughing at the, same, at the same time when she does. So, yeah, but it's funny, isn't it? It, had, it, it, had, um, it carried a, a huge significance for um, a lot of our audience that storyline, but I think, as you say, I was there for nearly eight years, and I think it was only about a year and a half of that whole time, and yet it, and yet it did have a, you're right, it did have a huge significance because representation of, uh, of being a lesbian is so um, rare uh, anywhere in, 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 in the entertainment industry, but particularly rare on prime time regular repeated drama it's just it, you know it's it tends to be you know it's a late night thing why that's weird isn't it so i think that that significance for the fact that you had families watching and and quite a lot uh, that i've spoken to of young women who were nervous about coming out still in this day and age still. i mean it, it, it's something really at the end of the day that it's part of everyday life so why why is it being treated as if it's not sort of thing <laughs> So I think for that for that reason it was it was uh, is revolutionary too strong a word maybe but along those lines and so many people who said that the, the fact that they were sat next to granny next to their mum next to their dad watching what was just a normal relationship it didn't matter that it was two women it just there were two highly you know highly intelligent highly functional women who fell in love with each other and the story 
Now, obviously, you have had the pleasure of working with some amazing people over the years. I mean, Hugh Bonneville, I know I spoke to him earlier on in the year, and he's such a lovely guy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Gemma Jones, so many great people. Is there someone that you've absolutely loved over everyone else working or someone that just, just they, they over, over, went over that your expectations of how they would be to work with? Gosh, I've never even thought about that. So obviously there isn't one person that immediately springs to mind because this is going to sound terribly gushy, but you know, nine times out of 10, people are lovely to work with. If you ask me the reverse, who's been a pain in the ass, <laughs> and there's one or two whose names I couldn't possibly know. <laughs> um, but that, those are rare. Those are rare, and therefore those are the things that stick with you. Isn't it terrible the way that negativity always sticks to us more than positivity? It's a terrible truth, but it is a truth nevertheless. So I can't, no. I, I, I think in terms of Holby, what's so lovely about Holby City is that because we had so many, well, they do have so many guest artists coming in, that's always the wonderful surprise is when you work with somebody and you know they're only there for an episode but you hit it off and meet there's some chemistry something happens where you hit it off with them and you still keep in touch with them over twitter and stuff like that that's that was a, a joy from that point of view but no i can't think of any one or two people that were over and above what i expected because on the whole i expect people to be nice because on the whole they are I mean, is there, is there a, dr- a dream person or project you, you know, you'd love to work on or with um, going forward? Have you got like a, a dream role or someone you want to work with? Um, the dream role thing is interesting, isn't it? I, I love singing. and I haven't sung for a long time uh, in a role, but that it's, it's, you know, it's jolly hard work. Because unlike other things, you have to keep your voice in good nick, in good condition the whole time. Um, so I'm always tempted to say a musical again, but, but they are extremely hard work. So I'm not sure, I, not sure I'm in the mood for hard work. <laughs> I think I feel like I've done the hard work bit. I, I would, I would, I've really enjoyed reading this book, you know. I'd love to do some more reading. I'd love to do that. Um, um, and in terms of people, there's so many, I wouldn't even know where to begin, but, but there's certain directors that I would love to, to be honest with you, the job that got paused, which was at the Many a Chocolate Factory, which was Habeas Corpus with Patrick Marlborough directing, that's the job I want to do next. <laughs> Hopefully for 2021, are you hoping to get back there? <laughs> exactly, I'm really hoping that it gets, that it gets, that it gets done, because it, it, it would have been a wonderful project to do. Um, now, obviously, just no. playing my husband in it, and we've worked together before as well. And he's a phenomenally brilliant actor, and in, and in fact, and, uh, various other people that I know that were going to be in it as well. So I hope that happens. And we know that obviously theatre has again gone through a ter- terrible time with London going back into tier three and all surrounding areas. So obviously, it'd be nice to get back into the theatres again to obviously support the arts, you know, however that's going to be. So obviously, we're hoping we can get back there as soon as possible. Yeah, as soon as possible, as long as it's safe. You know, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the short and long of it, isn't it? I mean, and the, the problem that the theatre have got, of course, is that, you know, they, they have to be 60% full just to break even. So doing social, having a socially distanced audience and making any money is simply a huge challenge. And, of course, ensuring everybody is a huge challenge as well. And, and I think the other thing that's going to be, that's very difficult for theatre is that, although you can just about do a socially distanced performance, maybe, perhaps. Backstage is another story. You know, backstage in those West End theatres and in, and in the other theatres, all the other theatres, they're tiny. You're all crammed together. You're squished into tiny dressing rooms. You're sharing, you know, tiny little loos. You're up and down those staircases in the back. Backstage. That backstage is tiny and uh, squished. I, it's, yeah, it's going to be a real challenge, but God, I hope, oh, I really hope we can work it out. The vaccine is the thing, right? I think the vaccine is going to make all the difference. As long and as it's it... not that far away as well, which is the other thing. Hopefully by Easter, we'll have a bit more normal. I know. I think my, my, we're, there's just going to be three of us on Christmas Day. Last year there was 20. Um, <laughs> so I, I, am, I am going to be t- telling my entire family that they are more than welcome, I hope, to come here at Easter and we'll have our Christmas, proper Christmas celebration in April. 
Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Now, I just want to say it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. But before we go, have you got any messages for anyone who is currently stuck in hospital at the moment? Well, my goodness me, I can't imagine how grim that must be. Let's not pretend any other. It must be grim and scary. Um, but I cannot imagine anywhere else in the world that I would rather be if I was going to be poorly than in our NHS system, because at least you know you know you're getting the best possible care. And Merry Christmas to you, and I hope that you get better very, very soon. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Of course, keep safe, and thank you again, Catherine, for giving up your time. Thank you. It's been delightful to talk to you, and well done. It's a really good thing that you're doing.